The egg. The, where it imagines that the nature of reality is that uh, your consciousness is that of a uh, higher life form and being than you are experiencing right now, uh, which is currently existing uh, as all beings on this planet to learn, you know, compassion, empathy, reality, what life is. All of the people whom you are inhabiting, uh, they exist permanently in time, and you simply come to embody them for a, for a life, for a life's worth. And you gotta go through all of them so that you can know what the fuck you're doing. Oh god, he's gonna go on ranting about Zen, and I have been looking for an opportunity and somebody managed to mention something that relates to it, so yes, I am. I'm gonna ramble on about Zen. <laughs> all philosophies that I've encountered, um, especially spiritual and religious philosophies, it's, it's there in all of them, you know? Like, they all have just a different way of trying to express ostensibly the same fundamental observations of reality. Because make no mistake, people, if you, if you don't like religion, you know, you got good, good reasons to. Uh, and you do. You, you absolutely do. But, um, make no mistake, if you're more a fan of science, that, uh, science, the, the religion was the first science. They were trying desperately to understand the world and the universe in which they found themselves, before they had concepts like a universe, and they were making observations and trying to put it together. And, you know, don't fucking be angry at the cavemen for not knowing how to use a microwave. When it comes to Zen in particular, I, if I had a Dharma uh, to teach, uh, my Dharma would be the science of Zen. Karma is the laws of thermodynamics and of, of Newt Newtonian physics and, and just all of that. That's what karma is. In the West, people have an idea about karma. Um, and perhaps in the East as well, because you know religion always kind of screws this stuff up and tries to make it just an easy, palatable, it'll make sense, hey, you can tell this to your kids kind of a, kind of a version of things. Um, but, you know, karma has no concern about right or wrong, good or evil, okay? You, karma is not, in the West I feel we have that sort of idea of karma. You do good things and good things happen to you. You do bad things and bad things happen to you, okay? So, eh. Uh, you know, there, there's a mote of truth in there, but you gotta start from the recognition that karma gives a shit about your ideas of good and evil, right and wrong, you know? It, it, there is no concept of what is good and what is bad to karma or to the universe, because karma is an expression of the fucking physics of reality. It is the observation and awareness that what goes up must come down. Damn, we were doing pretty good. I'm, I'm gonna reset that run, though. It is the observation that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. It is the observation that nothing in this universe is alone or disconnected. If there's nothing you can do or can choose not to do, there is nothing... Once you exist, you're part of it. And everything you say and do and think right down to what you think, changes the entire fucking universe. Okay? Because we're all interconnected, because those are the laws of fucking physics. I can't take a breath in this room without changing the air pressure on this planet. You understand that? You just... You got less air for a moment because of me. Just want you to be aware of the fact that your size is not how tall you are, it's not how much you weigh. Your size is most accurately measured by how many years you have been alive because since the moment that you were alive and we have to just artificially decide that you were alive separate from your mother at some point while you were in the womb let's say the moment that you exited the womb and were in the world since that moment and before but arbitrarily since that moment you know what's been going on here? You have been emanating light Do you know what speed your light travels at? I'll, I'll give you one guess. So the size of you is your age in light years. That is the that is the scope of your effect currently. Currently, for every passing day, your light goes a little bit further in the universe. You are a little bit bigger. Your influence. You have contributed to whether or not plants grow in Alpha Centauri 
Uh, once you're about 26 years old or something. Is Alpha Centauri the nearest? I, I never remember. Your light is feeding the galaxy. You are part of everything. And there is no escape from that. The idea that after the Big Bang, then there were a whole bunch of things is uh, an arbitrary conclusion drawn incorrectly on the scenario. The Big Bang, uh, I do agree, is better expressed as a sudden expansion of what is. Now, energy can neither be destroyed nor created, which means that all of that energy that you are and that everything is right now always was and always will be. You may have heard that phrase before in the Judeo-Christian spiritual texts, always was and always will be. You can also read them in your physics high school book. It, it can't come into being and it can't go out of being. So if all energy was in more or less one, again, arbitrary concept of a point in space and then suddenly expanded and took on all these shapes and these forms, guess what? It's not, not that energy anymore. It has neither been added to nor diminished. You are the light of the stars. If we're all alone, what's wrong with that? We've got each other, we've got each other. If there's nothing else, why is that so bad? Don't search me forever, nothing's forever now. I did that horribly, Greg, if you're here. One of the bands I was in, Five Years to Live, Greg Aubrey's tune, The Light of the Stars, one of our favorites to play. You are the light of the stars. You are the cosmos. You are... And some people won't like to hear this, but you are... God. So much as we can define God. God always was and always will be. God is omniscient and omnipresent. So God is everywhere and God is everything and God is... is Timeless. Okay, so you've just described the nature of all matter and energy. Well, not all matter, because that's the shape of the energy. But you've just described in less scientific terms, uh, you know, the makings of everything that we know there. That's a beautiful word. That's a good, but we can't use it because it's, it's, it's religious connotations. And so many people have used what God wants as though God wants something. <laughs> God wants something. Really? Does it have needs too? Is it lonely? Tell tell me about this this grand creator you've you've fashioned in your head. It, it just wants your love. Why does it need my fucking love? Is it as broken as I am? I could use some love. Are you telling me that the creator is fucked up as it really? If there's something out there to worship, let it be better than me is just where I come from, and, uh, you know, which is why uh, Zen Buddhism uh, worked for me so well. Because Zen uh, doesn't give a fuck about your gods and your ideas and all of that. Zen says, shut the fuck up, sit the fuck down, and find out what you are. And by finding out what you are, and who you are, and what, then you'll know what this is. Hmm? It points you in the direction of the most important discovery, which is the nature of the self. Oh, I'm still alive. How? We do not know. Well, we do know, because I am eternal, immortal, always was, always will be, just like you. J just like you. Yeah. I mean, you, in the sense that you understand you, no, you're dead. You, you might as well already be dead. Like, this is just, this is destiny, fate. You, you're, you're a corpse. But if you understood what you are in the context of, you know, in the big brain cosmos level thing, then you would also understand that, yes, you are eternal, immortal, always were, always will be. You were born perfect, and nothing has changed, and nothing can change. You are exactly where you're supposed to be, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You are the immortal, the eternal, the unending, because everything is because there's nothing special about you. Hmm? Or in other words, you are infinitely special. However you want to say it. Wan Hyo Sunum and the skull in the cave. You, you all know that one, right? I don't, I don't even have to tell it, right? Wan Hyo and the skull in the cave. We, we've all heard it so many times before. So Wan Hyo, if I've got the name right, Wan Hyo and, uh, and the other monk who really just should get better billing, I think, for this story, but, you know, when Wan Kyo is in the room, nobody sees anybody else. 
But so they, they pass out. When they wake up, it's the middle of the night. It's very dark. They don't have any light. They're in a cave. And uh, they're, they're parched. They're thirsty from the travels. They wake up. They, they drink some water uh, from, a, from a, a bowl or a cup or something that they find. Time passes. Daybreak comes. They wake up. And uh, they see in the light that what they had drank from the night before was not a bowl, was not a cup, and this is not a cave. What they'd stumbled into was a grave, mausoleum or so, you know, where you put the bodies in a cave instead of in the ground. They stumbled into one of those and what they drank the water from that had quenched their thirst the eve before was the skull of a man, the skull of a dead human being they had drank from, and both of them upon seeing the vessel from which they had drank the water the night before, start retching, vomiting, puking, because my god, we drank water from the skull of a dead man. There they are, retching and vomiting and everything, and all at once, Wan Hyo has an experience. In the middle of throwing up his night's earlier dinner, Chunks flying. He stops throwing up and he just starts laughing like a madman. I add that part. I add that part to everything. When I tell the story of like Buddha, I add that he was a crazy son of a bitch too. He just starts laughing. And uh, and the other guy is still puking over there and he says, stop puking. This water from last night saved our lives, quenched our thirst, made us feel absolutely lovely. We went back to sleep, we were fine, until we woke up this morning and saw that we drank from a skull. We felt just, it was a beautiful, but it, because it's in the shape of a skull, what we saw, now we've given it context. Now it was disgusting. Now it was horrible. When it happened, it was our salvation, it was our savior. But now in retrospect, we see the shape, the form of the vessel that contained the water that we drank from, and now it's disgusting to the point that it makes us both wretch. Stop puking. And it's said in that moment that Wan Hyo Sunim awakened and became the first uh, Korean monk uh, to have awakened. Having realized the nature of, you know, everything. It's the kind of story that, uh, if you're familiar with spiritual stories and just bedtime stories in general, then you go, oh, I see the lesson, I see the moral. But it's not really a story meant to see a lesson or see a moral. You know, the other monk standing next to Wan Hyo when Wan Hyo explained it, did not have the experience that Wan Hyo had had. Just because he understood. And surely he understood. Understanding is lovely. Knowledge, oh, so grand. But it isn't knowing. It isn't the wisdom of experience. It's no substitute for the moment that Wan Hyo had that caused him to laugh. I ran from a tiger and came to a cliff. I hung from the edge. I looked down and saw another tiger. On the ledge was a single strawberry. It was delicious. I've heard that one before. Uh, let me respond with another, okay? And this is gonna be a koan or, or a hwadu, if you're from the Korean lineage as I am. And you'll know the concept of a spiritual question is a hwadu. If you're Japanese, then it'll be a koan. Here's one, okay? See if you recognize this one. Why? 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 Are there 10 hot dogs in a pack, but only eight buns? <laughs> it's my co-op. Have you heard that one? To sell more hot dogs and buns. Oh, no, incorrect. Sorry. But that is, that is the answer I expect. That is the answer I expect. You are well on your way to spiritual enlightenment right now. There is something to it. And the reason why it really is a koan is because it doesn't matter if you get the answer right. It doesn't matter, matter if you give the correct words. It matters if... if you've had the experience of the koan. If it has reached down into the... into the cockles of your heart and your soul and changed you profoundly. The... the koan of the... 
hot dogs versus the buns. <laughs> Is it because we were putting the hot dogs with the buns, we assume they exist for each other? Ooh, real Hawkeye. That is an interesting way to deepen it. Um, but, no. <laughs> yeah, well, I, there's, there's, there's an essence, there's, there's something there. Deepen it. God, it's gotta be so fucking frustrating for an actual Zen master. Because even if you explain exactly what you mean, or exactly what you've experienced, it does nothing. It helps nothing. You know? Giving the correct answer to a question means nothing. I'll give you my hot dog answer. I'll give you, it doesn't matter. You know, the answer to the question is the same as the question, a gateway to what is real. So having the answer gets you exactly no closer to the truth. <laughs> so you're no closer to what's real, um, but you can have it if you'd like. What does the hot dog bun and the hot dog, what, what does the hot dog koan have to do with the, the koan of Wanhyo in the cave with the skull? that we were talking about before. If somebody just tuned into the live stream, they're like, what the fuck is going on here? One Hyo Sunim in the cave and the skull and the hot dog buns? How the fuck did we get here? Jesus, I need to rewind. <laughs> I've formed a new koan from two koans. It's a super koan. It's a hybrid ultra mega koan. And it's gonna burst your fucking reality open and make you realize the nature of everything. <laughs> Wan Yo and the Hot Dog Buns. That's what this live stream should have been named, but we didn't know that we were going there. But we could have, because all time is permanent. We were coming to this point no matter what. Hmm? It was gonna happen, and it will continue happening long after we are through it. But, at the moment that we began the live stream, we did not perceive that we would get to the point of Wan Yo and the Hot Dog Buns. And now we are in the moment of perception, so... What is the connective tissue between Wan Hyo, the skull, the cave, and the hot dog buns? <laughs> God, I love these streams. I feel like this is some kind of cult chant. We're getting there. We will, we, there's, okay, there's gonna be some Kool-Aid and a walk into the forest a little bit later, but I promise you, the pyramid spaceships will be waiting for us after we have left this, this mortal coil. We're just catching a ride on a comet, everybody. So, drink the arse, I mean Kool-Aid. Do you trust me? <laughs> the water that they drank was was a brilliant, glorious, life-saving thing. It was heaven. Until they looked and saw that the water that they drank had been drunk from a skull. And then it was hell. So where are heaven and hell? And how does that relate to the hot dogs? I ask you a question about why there's more hot dogs than there are buns. And I've framed a little trap there, haven't I? I framed you a little trap because now you're, you're looking at the fucking hot dogs and you're looking at the buns and you're saying, yeah, there's not as many buns as there are hot dogs. And I want a bun with my hot dog. Why the hell aren't there enough hot dog buns? What are they doing to me? This is a scam, this is a trick. They're trying, they're trying to get me to buy more hot dogs, more hot dog buns, because I'd have to buy like six packs or something in order for these to even out in the end, or I don't know how many you'd have to buy, but I have to, it's, it's never gonna, you know, like I'd have to go around and around, and then I'll still have more hot dogs, but then I could buy two two packs of hot dogs, and then that would add up, you know, if I had some, had some more hot dogs, and then I had bought a bunch. That's what they're trying to do to me. I see the scam, I see your fucking world. You see the skull. and perceive hell. The problem lie between the hot dogs and the hot dog buns. You know? <laughs> the fuck is this dharma? It's true! Problem lie between the hot dog and the hot dog buns. You perceive hot dogs and you perceive hot dog buns and they are in disproportionate equality to your eye. And the lack of uh, proportionality is a hell. And proportionality would be a heaven. I don't want to burst your fucking bubble. There ain't no heaven. There ain't no hell. There ain't no hot dog. There ain't no hot dog fucking buns. There ain't no skull. There ain't no water. I may have overshot, but... <laughs> may have come to the punchline on that joke a little early. But, you know, that's probably the best way. Isn't it? 
leave a gap or else people will think they understand. And understanding is uh, a boulder on the path to enlightenment. <laughs> I feel like I might be dead and this is either heaven or hell. Yes. See, that's a good place to be. That's a good place to be. Especially when somebody suddenly shows up and tells you that there's no heaven and there's no hell. In your own perception, in your own mind, who are you? Most of us, I would think, are the collection of our experiences, of our the places I've been, the ple thing, people, the people I've met, the things I've seen and done. I am, I am my memories. I am my mind. I am my opinions. I am my ideas. I am my thoughts. Conveniently, all of those are stored in the brain. The brain that dies. Oh, well, maybe it's less convenient now. Who, who the fuck are you? Is that it? You're the collection of those things? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. You're the collection of those things. So, tell me the infinite things that you cannot be because that's who you are. Describe to me all the places you can't go, won't go, wouldn't go, all the things that you can't do, won't do, wouldn't do, all of the people whom you will not sit with, all of the tea you will not take with the Zen Masters. Tell me all of the names of all of the people whom you will never know, all of the things that you will never see or experience or do, because you are the sum of your events and, and your memories and your ideas and your opinions. In other words, you are a collection of locks on a cage. Because if you were that person, hmm, you know, you don't dance. I always dance. You don't eat mushrooms. I love mushrooms! Tell me all of the things that you can't do, and I'll call them you because that's what you're telling me you are. Reminds me of a guy I worked with. We got into an argument about how he always hits the red lights on his way to work, but the red lights aren't more frequent. They just made a greater impact on his life. You're making me think about myself, and I hate it, so it's time for it. Well, that's... Hmm, you don't know who you are. <laughs> The nature of the self. I'll tell you, you want another story? I'll tell you another Zen story. Um, okay, so this is the story of Rishim Henjinim. Uh, and, and you can say it Hengjinim, if you want to say it like it's spelled. Rishim had gone his life always feeling as though he had a hole inside. That there was just a hole in the pit of his stomach and there was something missing and it needed to be filled. And Rishim went far and wide and did many different things and learned to do many things, thinking perhaps this, this thing will be that which fills my hole, which gives me meaning, which, which makes me feel like a person and not a shell. And then one day, he stumbled upon Master Falsen Sunim. Rishim found himself sitting before Master Falsen Sunim amongst a, a number of other people who had come to visit the master. And the master began to speak, and Rishim heard none of his words, but Rishim heard his voice. And in the tenor of his voice, Rishim recognized that this man had no hole. There was no emptiness within him. There was no questioning. This man contained what Rishim had sought. And so Rishim began to follow Master Paulson. Then one day, Master Paulson arranged a meditation retreat where all of his students who were willing would come and sit for seven days. The kind of meditation where you sit in meditation and then you work in meditation and then you eat in meditation and then you sleep in meditation, but you stay on the temple grounds and you meditate seven days straight. And on the fourth day of meditation, of constant meditation, Rishim Sunim stepped outside the temple and met a small boy playing with a ball in the street. And his days for these seven days, his days had been filled with a very rigid schedule and rigorous meditation and form and function and structure and uh, wake up at this time and, and eat at this time and meditate at this time and now walk and now sit and everything was so rigid and formal. And then Risham met this boy 
on the sidewalk, kicking a ball. And in that moment, Risham could feel, this is so different from what we've been doing. And also in that moment, and thanks to the several days of constant meditation, Risham also felt that this moment was as true and as perfect as all the others that he'd had throughout the meditation. And so Risham forgot his hesitance and played with the ball and the boy. Imagine a monk in training stood outside during the meditation, during a seven day retreat, playing football with a small child. And then the temple bell sounded and it was time for Risham to return to the meditation. And he did. But when he came back to meditation, he came without himself. Because he had left the self on the street next to the boy. Rishim Hengjanim had realized in that moment the nature of his self. His self was an anchor. The anchor of everything that he'd done, everything that he'd seen, everything that he'd been previously. The anchor of what he thought other people thought of him. The anchor of what he thought of himself. The anchor that would have stopped him from playing soccer with the boy because he was in the midst of a rigid formal meditation retreat. Risham kicked off the anchor, broke the chain for the first time in his life, and played soccer with the boy. And when he returned to the mat, he was not the same person. That person was dead. That person, Risham now knew, had never actually existed. But only in the mind of Risham Hengjanim. And of course, the, the fun of that story is that um, my name is Risham Hengjanim. As though you didn't see that one coming. That is my Dharma name. I am Risham. And that was my experience. And I let go of the chain. The chain of everything that had come before that wanted to shape everything that was now. I just let go. I just kicked it off. No more anchor. No more idea about me and who I am and what I am and what people would think if this and what people would think if that. I am now, this, here, I am. I recognize the nature of the self to be a, the burden upon reality, the limiting factor that stopped me from being able to experience life truly under the fear that I would not live up to my own expectations of what I thought myself to be. I invented the fucking prison and then locked myself inside of it. And after a few days of meditation, I looked around and realized, oh, this is a prison I've made and I've made it. And what's this in my pocket? The fucking key and I chose to leave the prison. Isn't that all that that is? Isn't that all what the opinions and the ideas and your, you know, all of that? Is any of it more than just a prison? More than a limiting factor on what you can be right now, who you are in this moment. My master, Master Hwal Sun Sunim, taught that you are a new person in every breath. You are dead and born again in each breath. I'm here to tell you, you can not just understand that, but you can experience that. It's not something that you need to conceive or rationalize or think about. That's just more, why well, that's just more prison you're making there. Build an idea around what is, put it in a box, give it a name, decide what it is and therefore what it isn't. Why that's, that's not getting any closer to anything, is it? but I'm me, I'm my opinions, I'm my ideas, that is me, that's my mind, that's, this is all I have. Well, okay. In the practice of Zen, you sit down and you shut up and you, you just, 
you know, focus on your breaths and you slow the mind and um, you are given the opportunity to see that you are something other than just that. That the affinity and the uh, almost desperate, I mean, that's what ego is, the desperate need for the rigidity of yourself is not you. It's a thing that you've created, but it's not you. Saying it, understanding it, knowing the story, knowing the answers to the questions, as I said before, the the question, if the question is the gate to, uh, you know, reality, to truth, uh, then having the answer is the same place. It's, it's, it's exactly the same place on the path. You know, there is a reality. It's just the other side of this gateway. You have the question, then there's a gate between you and, and the, the truth. You have the answer. There's still a gate between you and the truth. Having the answer is, is no supplement for experiencing reality. You teach a, a horse to stomp when you ask, two plus two, what is it? You know, it has the right answer. But the horse doesn't even understand intellectually that two plus two equals four. It knows that when it hears a human make a sound, that it's supposed to go. Do not fish in puddles on the way to the pond. <laughs> it's fun, though. I don't fish in puddles. I splash them. I jump in and splash around. Don't fish in them. Kick the mud around. Have some fucking fun. Why not? We only have eternity to get there, and we will get there. We are already there. It is there. It, it is. It is. It always was, and it always will be. That moment exists, and, and we'll get to that moment. And along the way, I'm going to fucking jump in some puddles, splash around, make mom do the laundry. We've come to the end of this live stream. I dropped some spiritual bombs. Get a mic. Two good runs. Bunch of bullshit about Zen you now carry with you whether you want to or not because apparently you're stuck with yourself and I've just implanted in yourself. You can't just drop the anchor, so along with yourself now you carry with you the Quadu, the Koan of Wankyo, the Skull, and the Hot Dogs. Live with that shit, everybody. <clears throat> Plum out. No